On this Friday night, the election campaign heads into the home stretch. You've got no interest in doing something you that you've promised no to do. With a fiery debate night behind them, the leaders turn their attention to key battlegrounds. And could a controversial question in the English debate be a boost for the bloc? Boosting immunity, the recommendation for a third shot, and who should get it? Plus, serving stardom, the Canadian teen tennis phenom overpowering opponents all the way to the U.S. Open final and a return to Gander. The planes are on top of each other coming down. The Newfoundland town where residents opened their doors and their hearts on a devastating day 20 years ago. Global National with Donna Friesen. Reporting tonight, Farah Nasser. Good evening and thank you for joining us. The debates are over and the final push is now underway in the federal election campaign. Today, advance polls opened across the country. And with Election Day just 10 days away, the two frontrunners came out swinging today, hoping to sway voters before they cast their ballots. There's lots of really big things that we are in the process of doing. If we change government, all those things. Aaron O'Toole has indicated that he will roll them back. All we've seen from Mr. Trudeau is more scaremongering, more spending, higher taxes, more broken promises, and no solutions. Aaron O'Toole focused his campaign today in the vote-rich Greater Toronto area. It's considered crucial for any party hoping to form government. Our David Aiken is traveling with the Conservative campaign. David. Well, Farah, Aaron O'Toole's riding is right on the tip of the Greater Toronto area, Durham, and because of that, he feels he has some insight into how to unlock votes inside the GTA. We need to rebuild trust with some Canadians, including some suburban folks in Ontario, and we've worked very hard to do that. Meanwhile, O'Toole will argue the Liberal leader no longer deserves the trust of GTA voters. Justin Trudeau came to power promising a new way of doing things. You remember, he promised sunny ways. He said he rejected the politics of division and was offering hope and hard work. Where did that Justin Trudeau go? There are 57 ridings in the GTA. That's more than in any province except Quebec. And the Liberals hold 49 of them. On Friday, both O'Toole and Trudeau will end their day in the riding of Whitby. That is right on the GTA's eastern fringe at the border of Tory Blue, Ontario and the Liberals' GTA fortress. The riding of Whitby has been Liberal since Justin Trudeau became Prime Minister in 2015, but it was Conservative when Stephen Harper was Prime Minister. And so this riding is a classic example of the kind of battleground that Aaron O'Toole has to win if he wants to be Prime Minister. I'm Abigail Beeman covering the Liberals. In this final stretch of the campaign, Justin Trudeau is trying to stick to his message that this election is about choice. When Aaron O'Toole is proposing to bring us back to Harper's approach on climate change, I am going to be ferocious in standing up for Canadians and relentless in pushing forward for the better World. The party feels O'Toole has given them easy openings to attack on gun control, climate and ripping up the popular Liberal $10 a day childcare plans. The race has been so tight and Thursday's debate didn't seem to change things. With their government on the line, Liberals are targeting the catch-all of progressive voters, meaning the NDP are in their sights as well, concerned about vote splitting. I think they'll be sending the message that a vote for Mr. Singh may very well just mean that the Conservatives come through and they scrap all, all the progress that we've made so far. In another point of contrast between Trudeau and O'Toole, Friday Trudeau said the flags lowered three months ago after the discovery of unmarked graves of residential school children should only come up when Indigenous people are ready to raise them. O'Toole says Canadians should be proud to raise them and he would do that at the end of September, the new National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. Abigail Beeman, Global News, Hamilton, Ontario. An Ontario man is facing charges for allegedly threatening Justin Trudeau at a campaign stop. Police say a 32-year-old man from Kitchener is facing two counts of uttering threats after a protest last month in Cambridge. The man's name was not released. A separate police investigation is underway in London after gravel was thrown at Trudeau during another campaign stop. With nearly one quarter of total seats in the country, 
Quebec is a key battleground in the federal election. Many believe the path to a majority government goes through that province. But few expected last night's English debate would cause such a stir in Quebec. It has Premier François Legault fired up and demanding an apology. Michael Couture explains what happened and the fallout. That was an attack for sure against Quebec. With fire in his eyes and emotion in every word, Premier François Legault defended his province and demanded an apology from the consortium of broadcasters. It stems from a question at the English debate on Quebec's secularism laws, which prevent public servants, teachers and police officers from wearing religious symbols. For those outside the province, please help them understand why your party also supports these discriminatory laws. The question seems to imply the answer you want. Those laws are not about discrimination. They are about the values of Quebec. Legault says moderator Shachi Curl unfairly characterized Bill 21 as discriminatory, adding the law has wide support across the province. So to Canadians who think otherwise... That Bill 21 doesn't apply in the rest of Canada. So please... Please, uh, it's not of your business. Legault also noted other federal leaders on the debate stage failed to stand up for Quebec Thursday night, even though many spoke up Friday morning. But it is wrong to suggest that Quebecers are racist. As a Quebecer, I found that question really offensive. Quebecers are not racist, and it's unfair to, to make that sweeping categorization. For the leader of the Bloc Québécois, it was too little too late. When it was time to defend Quebec values in English Thursday night, says Blanchet, we heard crickets. In a statement, the debate broadcast group said the specific question was addressing Quebec bills and, quote, did not state that Quebecers are racist, end quote. So it would seem Legault is not getting the apology he wanted. Farah. Michael Couture in Ottawa. Thank you, Mike. And as Global National goes on the road ahead of the election, Donna Friesen will be broadcasting from Quebec City on Tuesday. The five party leaders clashed over many issues in the debate, including the pandemic, but they all came together with a united message for Canadians to get vaccinated. We're all in this together. We've come so far in the fight against COVID, it's time to finish this pandemic for good. So get vaccinated. Vaccines are safe and effective for use. Vaccines are the best way for you to protect yourself, your family, and your community. Soyez responsable, soyez solidaire, faites-vous vacciner. Merci. We're all in agreement this is not a partisan issue, so please get vaccinated. Vaccines save lives, they're how we're going to beat COVID, and it's time for everyone to do it. Get the shot! The National Advisory Committee on Immunizations is now recommending Canadians who are immunocompromised receive a third dose of vaccine. NASI says that this applies to people 12 and older. Canada's chief public health officer says those who are moderately to severely immunocompromised have a weaker response to vaccines. Not everyone uh, even mount an increased response to the third dose, but some do. And so this represents a added um, layer of uh, um, increased uh, immunity and, uh, in adding that additional dose of um, mRNA vaccine. Saskatchewan is reinstating a public health order as the province grapples with the second highest rate of active cases in our country. Those who test positive will now have to self-isolate for 10 days. Unvaccinated people will also need to isolate if they come into contact with positive cases. The government is expanding testing and contact tracing. Non-critical surgeries are being reduced and booster shots are being administered for long-term care residents and those who are immunocompromised. The province's proof of vaccination system will be launched the week of September 20th. There is growing anger and frustration tonight from doctors in Alberta. They're worried the exponential spread of the highly transmissible Delta variant could soon cause the health system there to collapse. They're dealing with a surge of unvaccinated patients in hospital. In Edmonton, a pregnant woman died from a COVID-19 related infection after being admitted to the ICU. The last time hospitals were under this much pressure, the government imposed sweeping restrictions. But not this time, at least not yet. 
Heather Urex West reports. Alberta's doctors are angry. It's, it's very hard for me to even put into words what I'm feeling right now. We saw a complete abandonment of health and well-being for, for Albertans from the government. Dr. Nija Bakshi is part of a group of doctors that have been holding regular COVID-19 briefings since late August. The physicians had hoped that a late Thursday announcement from Alberta Health would help bend the curve of what has become a punishing fourth wave. What the province announced was money for home care and a plan to move up to 200 acute care patients out of hospital and into long-term care next week. I just want to stress right now that right now we're just, we're very concerned about our ICU capacity. That is our number one challenge and our number one issue. And for that challenge, home care funding is unlikely to help. Despite adding more beds, Alberta's intensive care units are filling fast. At one point last week, there were just nine beds available across the province. The last time the situation was this bad was back in May. But hospital numbers peaked after the province implemented sweeping restrictions, closing indoor and outdoor dining, fitness facilities, and moving K-12 classes online. Now, nobody wants to see that again. Nobody wants to see restrictions. But the fact is, what we've done so far has not had any influence on viral spread. It continues to grow, and unless something changes, we can expect it to continue to grow. Emergency medicine physician Dr. Joe Vipon says that is a terrifying thought. That means physicians are going to have to make choices as to who gets that life-saving treatment of intensive care and that means people will die who otherwise would not have died. Last Friday the province introduced a mask mandate for all indoor public spaces and a 10 o'clock curfew on liquor sales. The health minister says the province will wait to see if those measures have an impact before it does anything more. Heather Urex West, Global News, Calgary. Canada's rising star on the tennis court, Layla Fernandez. Coming up, the 19-year-old beats some of the best to make it into the U.S. Open final to face another teen titan. Canadian Layla Fernandez is preparing for the biggest match of her young career. She was ranked 73rd when she entered the U.S. Open. But the 19-year-old has stunned the tennis world, beating out Grand Slam favorites to secure her spot in tomorrow's final. And as Eric Sorensen explains, she's not the only teen with a Canadian connection to make history at the tournament. The Canadian sensation looks every bit the astonished teenager she is, and it has swelled the hearts of New Yorkers. How are you able to win that match and be in the U.S. Open Finals? I have no idea. <laughs> I've never seen anything like this. Tennis legend Chris Everett, almost giddy, assessing Montreal's Leila Fernandez. She's too good to be true. Look at her. And how about too good to be true times two? Emma Rajukanu, age 18, two months younger than Fernandez, born in Toronto but raised in the UK, has, like Fernandez, come seemingly out of nowhere to this moment. I'm in the final and I can't actually believe it. Thanks for everyone. <laughs> Against all odds, both have made the final, neither with the experience or the power of the top-ranked players, but are skilled and fearless. Rajukanu resists comparisons. To compare yourself and your results against anyone is, is probably like the thief of happiness. Fernandez's family keeps her grounded, and she believes hard work has prepared these young athletes for the biggest stage. We want to make a difference, we want to make an impact in, the, in tennis, and uh, this tournament just proves how well we're, we're adapting to everything. It's so remarkable and so inspiring, but I think what people have to understand is the years and years of work and sacrifice. It's all an inspiration to Fernandez's friend and playing partner. It really is encouraging, you know, like for us young people to see, uh, like, because in the, in the finals tomorrow, it's going to be like two, two teenagers playing. No one foresaw such a fairy tale final. Though the two teens seem to believe all of this really could come true. It just shows that if you believe in yourself, then anything is possible. Nothing's impossible. There's, there's no limit to, to, to what I can do. Only one will be champion, but this U.S. Open final will celebrate both young women when sports and youth can make impossible possible. And if they're lucky, it's only the beginning. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. Still ahead, what it was like to launch this newscast the week before the 9-11 attacks.
picture, please, uh, in the control room. It's difficult to know. Let's take it full frame if we can, please. But it looks as if that second tower has either had sections of it fall off or has just collapsed. That's a clip from a documentary airing tonight, Disruption, 20 Years of Global National. This news broadcast went to air on September 3rd, 2001, just eight days before the deadliest terror attack on American soil. Kevin Newman launched Global National and was in the anchor chair, as you just saw, on September 11th, and he joins me now from Toronto. Kevin, what strikes me is you are so calm in this clip. You had just moved here from New York to take on the Global National anchor role. You knew people who were in those buildings. I'm so curious, how did you put that aside, and what was that moment like for you? Well, I mean, you have to put it aside because you know that Canadians are watching and they're generally quite fearful. Uh, and so you, you, you press it down and, and you're careful not to add to the, the panic and the fear that was in the country on that day. Um, you know, that really was the event that changed a whole lot. Um, not only about how America saw itself, but how we would access America. The border became much more restrictive, uh, especially for Canadians of colour. Uh, it was the beginning of the surveillance society, and it led to two wars, one in Afghanistan that just seemed to end a couple of weeks ago, and one in Iraq that is still going on. So it really was a seminal event, and, and I think it was the beginning of two decades of disruption that really I don't think has ended. Hmm. Well, the documentary also explores how news has changed. Tell us about that. Well, I think, you know, this. <laughs> Halfway through the life uh, span of Global National in 2011, uh, the iPhone came out and all the reporters were suddenly able to go live just from their phone. And that was really important around the Arab Spring. Uh, Jazz Johal, one of the reporters at the time, and uh, his cameraman, Barry Acton were there and their big cameras were confiscated and so they looked at their phones and they thought well maybe we can report through cell phones and that was a new idea then and as we've seen as time has gone on the civilian witnesses have started to drive much more of the news agenda and we really are living in an era now where there are witnesses everywhere and things happen that can be captured and shared and I think that's had a big impact on the news flow. You know, you really connect those dots over these 20 years in terms of news events. But, but do you think the age of disruption is only 20 years long, or are we still in it? Oh, we're still in it. Uh, I mean, the, the last bit, which is life disruption, the COVID uh, pandemic, is another major story. And it's not over yet, obviously. As Donna Friesen says uh, in the documentary, we're probably only going to realize what profound change that has had in two or three years. So, no, I, I think the era of disruption, we're still very much in it. Kevin Newman, I really look forward to seeing this documentary again, and I know our viewers will really enjoy it as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Farah. And you can watch Disruption, 20 years of Global National tonight, right here on Global or online at globalnews.ca slash global national. I'm Ross Lord in Gander, the Newfoundland town that restored faith in humanity following the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Looking back 20 years later, people here still feel pride and they still feel sorrow. That story coming up on Global National. In the moments after the September 11th attacks, planes were grounded and thousands of airline passengers unexpectedly found themselves in the small town of Gander in Newfoundland and Labrador. Residents opened their homes and their hearts and their kindness became the impetus for a Broadway musical called Come From Away. 20 years later, our Ross Lord returned. Don't let the stubborn fog fool you. Gander prides itself on being an airport, not an outport. But there was no way to know what was coming on September 11th. Planes started to drop down out of the sky. I'd actually look it over runway 22 here and planes are on top of each other coming down. Welcome to unexpected uh, visit to Canada. We're in Gan Gander. In all, 38 planes landed here. Almost 7,000 bewildered passengers in a quiet town that was home to just 10,000 residents to begin with. School bus drivers who'd been on strike drove the so-called plane people to school gymnasiums converted into makeshift hotels. Gander's hockey arena became a warehouse for stacks of food and drinks. And the laid-back charm of the town and surrounding communities soon put their distraught guests at ease. And one guy said to me, he said, uh, where can you go in the world, sit on the steps 
of, of a church right across from the police station and drink a bottle of wine. It's not just that Gander accepted the so-called plain people, it's how people here embraced them and how deeply they considered their needs. The spare room was spick and span. The sheets were, as uh, I said before many times, dried on the line because you sleep a lot better when the sheets are dried on the line. At the start of a moment. The story is known now around the world thanks to Come From Away. First a hit on Broadway, then beyond. Now there's even talk of a Hollywood movie version. In Gander, permanent reminders include this chunk of steel from the World Trade Center and more fragile mementos, post-it notes at the airport's emergency center listing flight numbers. The notes are still on the wall 20 years later. There are no plans to remove them. Bonds forged in hardship are often strongest. For people here, it doesn't take much for the pride and the sorrow to return. As we speak, of course, there's the situation in Afghanistan is certainly something that that uh, you know turns the world's attention to it again and stirs up a lot of those emotions again. Pandemic restrictions have prevented some plain people from returning this year to show their gratitude, but fond memories are immune, like the streams of Gander drivers pulling over to offer their visitors a ride as they were out for a walk. Gander invented the first ride sharing. It was you know, the first Uber was happening in 2001. Problem is they just didn't charge for it, so. <laughs> They never will charge for it. 20 years later, their kindness is still free. Ross Lohr, Global News, Gander, Newfoundland and Labrador. Such a quintessential Canadian thing to do in such a deep moment of need. That is Global National for this Friday. I'm Farah Nasser. Thank you so much for spending part of your evening with us. Tonight's Your Canada is also in Newfoundland, the gorgeous Gros Morne National Park. Robin Gill will be with you on the Anchor Desk tomorrow. Until Monday, take care of yourselves and each other.